This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. Today. 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 With Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me Today. Today. Today with Jeff Fines. Welcome to another episode of Today with Jeff Fines. I'm glad you're here joining me. My name is Aaron. Did you ever overestimate yourself or your ability or your kindness or your goodness? Well, I have too. And that is also what Isaiah is doing in this verse we're looking at today in Isaiah chapter 6. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, now would be a great time to turn there. That's where Pastor Jeff is speaking from. And we're looking at some experiences that Isaiah had, which led Isaiah to discover that he's really been making mistakes his whole life. He's been overestimating his goodness and underestimating the holiness of God. Let's listen in to Pastor Jeff. But before we hop into Pastor Jeff, he warns us that this is the kind of message that's going to give our faith a reality check. So be prepared, but let's dive in together right now on Today with Jeff Vines. All right, from the get-go, got a question for you. You ready? How many of you, and raise your hand and be honest, you're in church, you know the story. Uh, How many of you have ever overestimated yourself? You can remember a time when you overestimated. Now, there's a story floating around right now about me that I want to clarify. I want to give my side of the story because if Dane Johnson were here this weekend, and thank God by his providence, he's not, uh, he would be telling you this story. But let me me tell you what happened. Uh, It was a couple of Thursdays ago, and I've been asked by the golf club that I play at to represent the club in playing other clubs around the area. So on Thursday, it's league play. Now, I haven't played in golf competition for a long, long time. I played a lot in college and some in when I lived in Africa, but it's kind of, I'm kind of new to this thing. So we all go over to a place called Candlewood and we get over there and we're going to play Candlewood's team. And I get out on the first tee and of course, it's a bigger deal than I thought. They announce your name, you know, Jeff Vines from Glendora. And then you get out there and you know, you hit your tee shot and my partner, my golf partner, and don't worry if you don't know anything about golf, I'll explain it along the way. But my partner comes over and he says, look, Jeff, this first hole, you hit your driver so far that you're going to have to turn it. You're going to have to hook it. It's called a draw. If you don't, it's going to go straight down into the river. So I'm a little nervous now. So anyway, I put the ball on the tee and strike it and think, okay, this is good. And it's right down the middle, about 80 yards from the green. I'm feeling pretty good. And then onto the tee steps, the part, the the guy that I'm going to be playing against. And I look at this guy and I think, are you serious? This guy probably weighed 150 pounds, maybe. Little guy. And he's older than me. And I'm not sure how much older, but I know he's older than me, and which is always good. And so I watched this guy hit his ball and he probably hit it 200 yards and it was straight, but it wasn't very far. And I think, I thought to myself, I'm going to destroy this guy because there's no way he's going to be able to keep up with me if he's hitting 200 yard shots into the green while I'm hitting 80 yards all day. And that's exactly what happened. All day, he hit 200 yard shots into the green and I hit 80 yard shots into the green. The only problem was he got closer from 200 than I did 85. This guy was good and he was ticking me off. And so I think, well, you know, after the first couple of holes, and he's making every putt that he looks at. And when he doesn't get on the green, he chips it in. He chipped in on me four times during, we didn't even make it to the 18th hole. He closed me out by the 16th. I didn't even get to play the last two holes. And when it was all over, I walked over to this guy and I put my arm around him and I said, sir, there are two things I want to say to you. And he said, what's that? I said, number one, I said, I will not soon forget this beating that you gave me. And he smiled. And second, I said, would you mind telling me how old you are? He said, 74. (laughs) 74. This guy, 74, handed me my lunch. And then he had the nerve to look at me and to say, today's my birthday. (laughs) I could tell you more, but if it it wasn't for the fact he was such a nice guy, I I wouldn't have liked this guy. Because it was, it was devastating, but I deserved it. I know I did, but I, I just thought, man, there you go again. 
Now, the reason that's a great segue into what I want to talk to you about is because that's exactly what happens to Isaiah. He discovers that he's done two things. He's made two mistakes for his entire life, and he finds out those mistakes when he comes into an encounter with God. And by the way, just let me tell you, this is the kind of message that gives you a reality check because the same three things that happened to Isaiah should, if you are an authentic follower of Jesus, have happened to you at some point in your life. So if I go through these three things and these things have never happened to you, you've got something to be concerned about. The Bible says this happens to every person who is the authentic, genuine believer, follower of Jesus. These three things happen to you at some point in your life. Because what's going to happen to Isaiah is he's going to realize when he encounters the holiness of God that he's been severely overestimating his own goodness and severely underestimating the holiness of God. And when that happens, three things happen to him, the same three things that should happen to you. Here's the first one. When you come into contact with the holiness of God, you are first of all overwhelmed. Here's what the Bible says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now stop right there. Imagine that. Imagine coming face to face with God. How many of you would like to do that? Yeah, there's a smart pe- there's smart people in this room. Yeah. I'm not sure. And he was seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And the angels cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now this term translated holy, holy, holy is to let us know that God has this otherness to him. Uh, Do you remember the song by Joan Osborne, What If God Was One of Us? Well, this is to show us God ain't one of us. There's a superlative to God. He is above and beyond. That is, if we came into contact with God, here's how our our response would be, wow, I knew you existed, but I had no idea you were like this. I had no idea that you were this holy and this pure, that you were this above and beyond. Now think about this for a moment. Don't we do the same thing even in humanity when we come into a we're coming into contact with somebody that's superlative, above and beyond. Aren't we kind of wild? Don't we kind of step back and think, wow, hey, the first time I met my wife, Robin, the first time I met her, I thought, and I wasn't really interested, that interested in girls before I met my wife. Uh, I thought they were a necessary evil. Now, let me explain that just for a second. <laughs> you know, you have to have a girl to take to the prom and to dates, but I really wasn't that into girls until I met this girl. And I thought, wow, this is something different. I didn't know this kind of beauty existed. You know, that's what happens. Every man who meets the woman, he marries. Superlative. First time I saw Tiger Woods play golf was at East Lake Country Club in Atlanta, Georgia, the tour championship. I'd been invited to go. I saw him pull hook his drive into the trees and there's a crowd that gathered around him. I was one of the crowd and we were all watching and he had to hit his golf ball 210 yards hook it around a tree and then make it rise up over another tree and then land it on the green softly. And doing that from 210 yards, we all stood and watched as he did it, put it about six feet from the hole and made the birdie. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, I did not know it was possible to make a golf ball behave that way. In the human experience, when we see somebody that is other than, that is above what we've ever seen before, that's superlative, we're attracted. However, stay with me now, there's a part of us that is intimidated as well. We're attracted by it, but we're intimidated because it reminds us of who we are or who we're not. When I used to work out at the gym in Auckland, New Zealand, I'd go down to the third floor and they had this big poster of this dude on the wall. I remember seeing it the first time I walked in there and this guy was just ripped and cut. And at first it was like, wow, look at that. That's impressive. But after about two weeks of working out, I started to hate that dude. Like, come on, man, I'm, no matter how many times I work out, no matter how many protein uh, drinks I drink, I'm never going to look like that. So I started like, doing this as I went to work out. I, I hate that guy. You know what I mean? Tiger Woods, when I saw him play golf, I wanted to quit golf. I just wanted to get, I'm never going to be like that. Why even play? I'm never going to be like that. So it's intimidating. It's called in business, the Peter principle. And the Peter principle says this, that the most gifted and superlative people, they have to start their own business. They have to launch out on their own because they're never going to climb the corporate ladder where they are because they are a threat to their superiors. So sooner or later, they got to go out on their own. Now, that's why you and I don't want a holy God. In postmodern world, we want a God of love. But we don't want a God of hope. We don't want a God that comes down on Mount Sinai and gives the Ten Commandments and power and authority. 
Because that only makes us realize how lacking we really are. We don't want a holy God. We just want a loving God. Now, what I do find interesting is that my friends who are seeking will say to me, I don't believe in your God because I think he should use his holiness to take care of the injustice in the world. And then I'll ask them, what exactly do you want him to do? And they'll say, I want him to zap a few people. And then I say, do you want him to zap you when you're unholy too? And of course, you find out that they want God to use his holiness against injustice, just not their injustice. Here is Isaiah, the most righteous man of his day. I mean, he's good at being good. He's the most holy prophet of God. Nobody's like Isaiah. And yet when he comes into contact with the holiness of God, you remember what he says? Woe is me, I am ruined. I am shattered into a million pieces. I am undone. The actual Hebrew word means I have come unglued. He's terrified. Isaiah is terrified. Same thing happened with Job. Job said, I see you with my eyes and I abhor myself. In other words, the more I understand about you, God, now that I see you the way you really are, I see myself the way I really am, and I'm scared. Do you remember in Mark chapter 4? The disciples are out in a boat, and there's a storm that comes, and the waves and the winds, and they're holding on for their dear life. They think they're going to drown. They think they're going to die. And the Bible uses a Greek word that suggests they are frightened. They are afraid. But then what happens next? Jesus comes walking on the water. And the Bible, according to the Greek word used in the text, the disciples move from being afraid to being absolutely terrified. In other words, the rescue is more terrifying than the storm. The storm is nothing compared to standing in the presence of God who created all things. You say, what's your point, Jeff? Well, the point is when you come into contact with God and you begin to see him for real, who he really is, you see the superlative nature of all of his nature. For instance, his justice. There are a lot of you who might think, you know what? God just doesn't seem to be fair, doesn't seem to be just. If I were God, I'd, I'd handle things a little bit differently and I'd take some of these mean people out. But if you come into face, to face contact with God, you begin to see that his justice is far beyond your justice and you begin to see him for who he really is and you would step back and think, oh, that's why God does that. Oh, I got it now. That's why all these things work like this. Oh, I got it. God, I understand now. See, there are two things I know for certain that I say it all the time. Number one, there is a God. Number two, you're not him. And because you're not him, you don't think like God. If you were to come face to face with God, you would look at his justice and you'd think, oh, I got it, God. I understand now why you work this way. Same thing is true about his knowledge and wisdom concerning the details of your life. A lot of you think, if I were God, I'd be running this planet a little differently. And if I were God, I sure wouldn't be running my life the way he's running my life. But if you come face to face with the wisdom and knowledge of God, you'd say, oh, I got it. I see why you're doing all this. I got it now, God. I see where it's all gonna end up. You're not God. You don't see it. But the most intimidating factor of the nature of God is his holiness. And here is why. When you come into contact with it, you'll be overwhelmed. Isaiah in chapter 64 later writes this. All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Now look at that. Did you notice something? Isaiah doesn't say, my sins are like filthy rags. He says, my righteous acts are like filthy rags. And when I come into contact with God, I shrivel up like a leaf and the wind blows me away. What's he saying? He says, you will cower before God because even on your very best day, even, on, even when you're good at being good, you still pale in comparison to the holiness of God. The problem is, for most of us, as I've said before, you still think God grades on a curve. All you got to do is be better than the other guy, better than your neighbor. And you say to yourself, well, at least I'm not that bad. And God says to you, whoa, 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 whoa. Your neighbor's not the standard. I'm the standard. God's holiness is the standard. You're hoping that when you go to judgment day, you get in, behind, behind, or get in line behind Stalin or Hitler or somebody like that. And then you look good. God says, don't compare yourself to other people because if you do that, all of you are in the same boat. All of you, me, you, together. God is the standard and we tend to grossly underestimate the holiness of God and grossly overestimate our own goodness. So when you realize that, when you come face to face with the holiness of God and you realize that even your best efforts on your best day are so far off the mark, that even in the best of times, you are nowhere near God and that one day, one day, 
You're going to stand before this God and give an account for the way you've lived. That's overwhelming. Now, here's the second thing that it is. Not only is it overwhelming, but God's holiness strips us. Look at what happens in verse 5. Isaiah says, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now, he says two things, and I want you to stay focused here. First of all, he says, I'm ruined. When I come into contact with the holiness of God, I'm ruined. I am unglued, it says. I have come undone. I am unglued. And second, he says, I have unclean lips. Two images that you have to understand. The first is this. Let's deal with unclean lips first. Why does he say, I have unclean lips? Well, the answer is because he's a prophet. And to a prophet, his identity, the glue that holds him together, that makes him acceptable, that makes him okay, his identity, his significance is found in his lips, in the words that he speaks. To put it another way, what the arm was to Nolan Ryan, the lips are to Isaiah. What the feet were to Fred Astaire, the lips are to Isaiah. What the camera is to Steven Spielberg, the lips were to Isaiah. He was a prophet of God. He spoke on behalf of God. When all else failed, Isaiah could always fall back on the reality that, hey, I may be weak in these areas, and I may have missed the boat in this area or missed the mark over here, but after all, I am a prophet of God. Now, stay with me here, because this is mind-boggling. It's interesting, when Isaiah meets God, he doesn't start thinking about his sin. He starts thinking about his righteousness. You with me? When he comes into contact with the holiness of God, he does not look at his sin, but instead he looks at his strengths. He repents. He repents of his righteousness. It's like his good deeds are the ones that he thinks about, what he's good at, what he believes he's best at. Listen, you have something in your life that you think makes you acceptable and okay. All of you. And your identity is tied to that thing. And you think, as long as I have this in my life, the world has to accept me. For some of you, you're just handsome. You, and you say, you know you are. Hey, I, I may not be smart and I may not be able to do these things. Not that you can't be both handsome and smart. I didn't say that. But you say to yourself, you know, but I've got my looks. And as long as I have my looks, the world has to accept me and they will accept me. For others, it's, it's, uh, you, you, you're a musician, yeah, you, and that's your identity. That's your significance. You say, you know, I'm not good at these other things, but I'm a great musician, and the world has to say, accept me. I'm acceptable to the world. I'm significant. For others, your athletic prowess. You're an athlete, and you say, you know, I can't do these other things, but I'm great at athletics, and the world will accept me, and this is my security, and this is my significance. For some of you, it's your ability to cook. You're a great cook. For some of you, it's your ability to eat. <laughs> Whatever it is, all of us have something. All of us have something we say, you know, this makes me acceptable. This is my identity. This makes me okay. And when Isaiah says, I am become unglued, he is speaking psychologically. Yeah, psychology was in the Old Testament too. He knows that everybody has something that's a basis for your self-esteem. In the same way you do that with the world, you do that with God. Everybody has something in their lives that you think makes you okay with God. And when you stand before him, you're going to appeal to that thing. And you're going to say, well, I didn't do all this, but I did do this, God, and that makes me acceptable before you. Now, here's the problem. Isaiah discovered when the glue that you think holds you together and acceptable before God meets the holiness of God, you become unglued and shattered in a million pieces because you realize that what you, make, what you think makes you okay is totally inadequate before God. It pales in comparison. You're not even close. And for Isaiah, it was his lips. He would think, I'm acceptable because I'm a preacher. I'm acceptable because I speak your word. There's a problem, though, with that. There's a story of a king. He, uh, he has a gardener that comes into his court. And the gardener says, king, you know that I have a plot of land beside your plot of land, and I grow carrots and vegetables. This year, I grew a carrot. This is the best carrot I've ever grown and I wanted to come personally and deliver it to you out of love, respect, and appreciation for the way you rule the kingdom. And the king discerned his heart that it was genuine. And before the gardener left, he said, Sir, that plot of land that I own next to yours, I'd like to give to you. 
It is obvious that you're a great steward of the land, and I pray that everything you do prospers. And the gardener left overjoyed. Now the nobleman who works in the king's court overheard the conversation. He thought, wow, I mean, if that's what you get for a carrot, what would you get for a really nice gift? So the next morning, he comes waltzing into the king's kingdom with a black stallion behind him. And he says, oh, king, you know that I breed horses. This is the best horse I've ever bred. And out of love and respect and the way you rule the kingdom, I'd like to give you this black stallion as a gift. And the king also discerned his heart, said nothing and dismissed him. Could tell the look of astonishment on the nobleman's face. And the king said, let me explain. The gardener gave me the carrot you gave yourself the horse. You got it? Even when we do great acts of good, more often than not, it is self-serving. And Isaiah learns, when I come into the presence of God, what I thought made me so strong makes me so weak compared to the superlative holiness of God. George Whitfield said that when you want to have peace with God, you got to do two things. Old preacher, Whitfield said, you got to, number one, repent of your sins, And you expect him to say, repent or receive Jesus, but he doesn't. He says, if you want to have peace with God, Whitfield says, you've got to repent of your sins. And second, you've got to repent of your righteousness. All those things you think that because they're in your life, you can stand before God with your head held high because they make you acceptable. Again, Pastor Jeff is speaking from Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah discovers he's been making mistakes his entire life. And again, I can relate to that. I'm sure you can as well. That is where we're going to have to pause our message for today. But next time, we're going to finish this message looking at what we can apply to our own lives from the mistakes that Isaiah made in his life as it relates to God. The holiness of God not only shows you the seriousness of your sin, but the sin of your seriousness that you are so serious about being holy and good, you think that's gonna save you. When in reality, you are overestimating your own goodness and underestimating the holiness of God, you're losing on both ends. I look forward to your company next time as we finish this message and continue to dive deep in that reality check for our faith right here on Today with Jeff Vines. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.